they refer to this as the ETC, the electron transport chain, in oxidative phosphorylation, they call OxFos. I have to say this is one of my favorite chapters of the metabolic pathways, because I worked on it in my second postdoc. We worked on this, and so that's what we specialized in. And plus, it's unlike any of the others. Okay, both good and bad. Okay, so in some ways it's more complicated, in some ways it's more simple, but it, it is. It's unlike any of the other pathways. This one's also a little different in the sense that, you know, before we had anabolic and we had catabolic, we either breaking things down and building things up. This is a little bit of both because we're going to make water in the end. And we're also, it's linked to electron transport chain. I mean, linked to, it is electron transport chain. It's linked to the citric acid cycle. So we're already breaking down and getting that NADH and the FADH2 that we've been adding up from all these other pathways. It's funneled ultimately to here. Okay, if we're going to be using it for energy. And this is also the point where you finally figure out, you get to hopefully understand why NADH can make up to 2.5 ATPs whereas a, uh, FADH2 can only make one, up to 1.5 ATPs. Okay. All right. So the electron transport chain, there's a little asterisk. Some books might even say that there are five, uh, five complexes, but most of them will tell you that there's four, four that's a part of the electron transport chain. That complex five, that some books call it, is really the last step for oxidation phosphorylation. So that's, that's why it's a little, it has nothing to do with the, the transport of electrons, and it'll make more sense once we get to that. So we're gonna call the electron transport chain the first four complexes. They, are, they have multiple names in these. <laughs> Many times they call them, by using Roman numerals, complex one, two, three, and four. What I mean is, so for example, and many times I'll refer to it as that, that way as well. So we may say, which let me change the meter on this. Um, so they may say, oh, it's complex one. And they use Roman numerals. Complex two, we actually have seen part of complex two already because it's the one that's part of the citric acid cycle. But each of these complexes also have very descriptive names. I mean, they tell you what they do. So it makes sense. Since we've already learned these family names, they help tell you what, what they do. But they, it is the electron transport chain. There are four complexes. Each complex has multiple protein subunits that all come together in these big, big, well, supra complexes, reality. They are membrane bound, okay? which is very important. And their location is very important. I've been stressing that for each of these. For example, glycolysis occurred in what part of the cell? Cytosol, right? Whereas gluconeogenesis was a little different, but part of it had to be in the mitochondrial matrix and part of it had to be in the cytosol as well. Okay, whereas citric acid cycle was in the citric, citric acid cycle? It's in the matrix. With that one little asterisk, meaning that one enzyme that's also connected to this does have a part of it that's attached to the membrane. Okay, um, the urea cycle is one of those little special ones. Part of it had to occur where? In the matrix, and then part of it occurs in the cytosol as well. And what, and not only that, but the urea cycle occurred in what cell, what cell line? The hepatocytes. Okay, gluconeogenesis, oh, wait, I did that one. Beta oxidation occurred in the matrix. Okay, and that, those are the ones that we've covered so far, I think. Wait. Okay, well this one, occurs within the mitochondria, and we're gonna find out that most of it is inside the inner membrane. Okay, there's one exception that's very, very important that's not in the inner membrane, but most of it is in the inner membrane. And not only that, but it's directional. Like, each complex has to face a certain direction or otherwise chaos would ensue. Actually, it, would, it wouldn't be viable, so. All right, so there are four complexes. And then there are two electron carriers. One's coenzyme Q, okay? So which a lot of times we abbreviate coenzyme Q as CoQ. And you probably have even seen it as a supplement and things like that that sometimes people can take. And then we have cytochrome C. And I do apologize because once again, 
sometimes the vernacular can be ambiguous. It's really important, the fact that this one, notice it's cytochrome C and it's a lowercase c, and this C is not italicized typically. That makes sense once you see why. Because one of the complexes themselves has another cytochrome inside it that they call the C1, and that one's italicized usually. <clears throat> and historically, I don't know why but they get their names. All right, and then there's this whole series of reactions that utilize either FADH2 or NADH, and it does a single electron at a time. Remember, does anyone remember, I mentioned it briefly, but how many electrons can FADH2 um, don't, well, well, we'll just cover that whenever we get there. Okay, and then in the end, oxygen is reduced to make water. Okay. And so, as a net result, what happens is you get protons, and I got a better picture of this coming up in just a moment. We get protons that get pumped from the inside of the mitochondria, the mitochondria matrix, and then they go to the intermembrane space. So you said that it moves one electron at a time? Well, yes, but it does it very, very fast. Okay. You're going to see, it's sort of like the turnstiles at Disney World. That's what it kind of reminds me of. Or universal. Pick your part. <laughs> this is just one of the cartoons that we have. I've got two or three here that are all related. But I like this one because it shows you the flow of the electrons and also the directionality. So, and you may want to draw something like this and just have it. In fact, I'll show you well, I, the way that I would draw, whenever we start to talk about each of the complexes, how I would do it if I was taking notes on it. Okay, but so we have the, you know, the holy of holies of the, the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix, which is, Krebs cycle is just another term for the citric acid cycle, remember. Whereas, so the citric acid cycle is here, beta oxidation is also occurring. And then this right here is complex, this is not part of the electron transport chain. This is where the oxidative phosphorylation is occurring. Okay. But I want to point something out. If it's NADH, that's is the starter, notice it starts with complex one. See, this is the inner membrane. This is the intermembrane space. That's CoQ, coenzyme Q. Please note the flow of electrons. That's what this is trying to show you. And this is what really trips people up. This is probably one of the hardest things to get down is the electrons flow from NADH to complex one, and it goes complex one to, co to CoQ to complex three to cytochrome C to complex four. Notice it doesn't go to complex two. Whereas if you start with FADH2, it skips complex one. It goes to complex two, coenzyme Q, to complex three, cytochrome C, and complex four. So if you start with NADH, you skip complex two. If you start with FADH2, you skip complex one. That's why they're not even showing it here. That's why I like this one. Um, this is the whole reason why NADH can make up to 2.5 ATPs, and FADH2 only makes 1.5. I'm going to say this over and over and over again. And if that's because if you notice, complexes one, three, and four all pump protons. And they always go, the protons always go from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Whereas complex two does not. No protons get pumped across. So because of that, FADH2 doesn't move as many protons across. And the whole goal of the electron transport chain technically is not to make ATP. That's why they, they consider it a coupled metabolic pathway. It's coupled to electrooxidative phosphorylation. The whole goal is to pump those protons across. So the electrons go from here through the membrane to ultimately make water at the expense of protons going through the little turnstiles, so to speak, to go out here. And then the whole purpose is these protons, if they, if they didn't come back in, it would short circuit. This is like a battery, it would short circuit. So it, and this is called an ATP synthase. ATP synthase literally does look like a turnstile. I'll try, to, I'll try to bring up the YouTube video of it. And so it literally comes back in. The protons can only flow through that gate, that turnstile, and it literally forces ATP to be made. 
because ATP does not want to be made. You know, it's energetically favorable to break down, not to make it. And so it literally physically acts as a motor. This is considered a motor. And so it forces it to come together. The ADP, the inorganic phosphate, literally comes and is forced to make ATP because the protons go through the little turnstile and it turns it around. So the whole purpose of the electron transport chain, again, is to pump protons out by the movement of electrons. And then for oxidative phosphorylation, these protons come back through the turnstile called ATP synthase in order to make ATP from ADP. Okay, so now let's start to use some of our chemical logic. If protons are being pumped out here in the intermembrane space, is the concentration of protons going to be high or low? So the concentration of protons is high in the intermembrane space. So does that mean that the pH is going to be high or will the pH be low? Low. Because remember, it's pH is equal to negative log of the concentration. So the pH is low. Whereas in the matrix, I don't have as much room to write. Since protons are being pumped out of it, is it going to be a low concentration of protons or high concentrations? It's low, and so will the pH be high or will the pH be low? The pH itself is high. I don't have enough room to write all that down. And like I said, I've got this. This is the same figure. It's just where the answers are there. Low pH, high concentration. High pH, low concentration. So there's this pH gradient that forms because of the movement of the electrons. My wife mentioned it to me, bringing me something to drink during this class. I hope she does. I'm getting low on my Diet Pepsi. Even though I am not officially endorsing any products here, please note that. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that, that the products in the food court, soda products are Pepsi products. In the food in the, court, like, I had no idea. Mm. Backyard burgers. Yeah. yeah so to get my Pepsi fix, I have to go to Backyard Burgers to get my oh. Pepsi Now, is it staying that way even though? I described it now because they just took the labels off all their machines. So oh, okay. They're not staying. All right. Yes. For those that ever watch this video, for all of my Arabic followers out there, you can completely ignore this. <laughs> this dilemma that we have here in the States. Pepsi and Coke. <laughs> but yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. All right. This is an even more simple cartoon that came from the old book. You can see, but it's the exact same thing. One thing I like about it is it does show, does anyone remember from anatomy or physiology or whatever what that's called? A little crinkly, the, the Christie, Christie. Mm -hmm. It's kind of faith integration, Christ, A. Uh, I don't know, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, but yeah, this is just a little sim simplification of the same thing that we've been talking about. All right, and then this is the words. So I'm trying to show it in pictures, trying to show it in words. But once again, you, we form this proton gradient. Okay. The proton gradient also is establishing this voltage gradient. So it really is like an electrical battery in many ways in vivo going on. And depending upon the cell type, you can go from few to lots of mitochondria. And all the mitochondria are you know, doing this for the most part. Okay. What's one cell type that doesn't have very much mitochondria in particular? It makes sense. It doesn't require a lot of energy. It's actually been used for energy storage. The fat cells, in particular, the white fat, the white fat cells, the lipocytes. They do. Whereas something like the heart has large quantity of mitochondria, right? Because it needs lots of energy to keep on going. So, mm -hmm. so with um, the HP synthase, like in histology, we were learning how in thermogenesis, um, that pump is protons are forced. We're going to actually talk about, talk about thermogenesis later on, so you're skipping ahead. But what, what you do is you short, so you short circuit it. Okay. And so you don't make ATP. They put in what's called, um, um, oh, you make a pore using, um, there's a word that, uh, channelopathy. I can't think of the, the official word for it. It's off the top of my head. But essentially, there are different things. One is thermogenin, which is a protein, and the protein's a porn. It, it, it's, it looks like a, kind of reminds me of a lifesaver, um, where it sticks in and makes a hole. UCP. And so, yeah, and that's the uncoupled protein. 
Mm -hmm. And so those, what they do is then the protons, why go, and this is why I always say, I always use this analogy, when I'll use it again, I'm just gonna forewarn you because I like this analogy. So whenever we talk about thermogen, the way that it works is whenever I went to Duke, that was back before their football team was good at all. I mean, their football team was atrocious for years and years and years. They didn't win any games. And so literally, they had like the ticket area with a little turnstile, and they just left the gate open next door to it, where for any students, anybody could just walk in. Why would you want to go through the pay and go through the turnstile when you can go through the open door? And so all those students would just go through the open door. It's free. We'd go to the football game because no one wanted to, unless it was, they may have closed it for like Florida State and played some, some good team. But otherwise, they were just trying to get bodies in the seats. And so that's the way that it works with the thermogen and the uncoupling protein is you still have the ATP synthase. It's still there. The turn's still still there, but they leave a door open. And so it's easier for the protons to go usually through that door. And so you still have the heat given off from the electricity, you know, for lack of a better word, from the, the electrons moving, but you don't make any ATP from it. So that's why we keep the brown adipose tissue is, is warm for warming, for like newborns and things like that. Okay. All right, and then the oxphos part of the electron joint that's connected to it is just where together the protons go back through ATP synthase and it literally forces, like I said, there's a really cool video based off of crystal structures where the ADP and the inorganic phosphate is literally forced together to make ATP. And then the water is actually made from oxygen, which is not shown here, and that's why this is not a balanced equation. And so, so these are the complexes. Like I said, many times they're called by the Roman numerals. There is. I don't really remember what that song is. Oh, I do remember what that song is. Um, <laughs> you do. It's not. I have to always give a disclaimer because I use a word that some may find inappropriate <laughs> in part of the song. It was not one of our students that made the song. Okay, and so I haven't checked to see if it's still available. Um, but yes. But it does help you remember. It goes through the entire, well, it may not help you remember, but it goes through the entire electron transport chain. And so these are the four complexes. And it gives them, it does give their generic, you know, complex one, two, three, and four. But then it gives you, you their full name. So whenever I would do this, well, the way that I would do it, let's see, will this let me... Oh, let's see, what's the best way? Could I? Do you want us to know both one and like I would. Okay. And once we get started, and especially once you learn what happens in it, it's actually pretty easy. So the way, and what I would do if I were you, is I just get a sheet of paper and have, just have another sheet of paper that as we talk about these and we go into great detail over each one of these, is just have a big, where you kind of draw it. And so... This is why, you know, of course, this is the inner membrane. This would be the intermembrane space. This is the mitochondrial matrix. Okay. And then you're going to have one, depending upon how you draw it, it kind of looks like a gun or the state of Florida. So <laughs> your book draws it like the gun. That's complex one. Okay, and I can say, and like I would just keep this sheet, the paper separate or whatever, you can always staple it up and in. And that way as we talk about each one, then you can add to what that makes. And it's, it gets pretty big. That's why I'm using the entire sheet. But that's why on that sheet you can put, you know, down here, oh, it's complex one. Maybe give its real name. I shouldn't say real name, it's full name. But the full name, and it, like I said, it tells you exactly what it does, what it is, is NADH. And they use a colon, but ubiquinone, was ubiquinone is coenzyme Q. Oxidoreductase. because all four of these are involved in doing redox reactions. So that's why they all have like oxidoreductase, dehydrogenase, reductase or oxidase in their names. So this literally lets you know, hey, it's going to be transferring electrons from NADH to coenzyme Q. 
That's why I say the name, once you understand what that means, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. And then, like, if you wanted to be really pretty, yes, these are still lipids. Oh, whoops, I didn't do a very good job, but you get the idea. I'm not really good at drawing it. And then two, which, if I were you, I would believe that. Like, give me this list. This is my wife. And so, she's my wife, Deborah. Once again, this is not any chocolate type of product endorsement for chocolate. Thank you, Eddie. She's on spring break this week, which is not fair. See ya. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, so like I would keep this as a separate sheet, and then on the sheet you could write, write out the names. That way you can draw and add to your figures as you go along. Like a creature, draw your own. I don't know adult coloring books are kind of you know in vogue right now, so you could. I don't, I don't care. But all right, complex two is the one that's from the citric acid cycle. Yeah. What's the FMN again? The film transfers electrons to FMN in complex one. Oh, FMN is FADH, FAD or FADH2 without the A. Okay. A is you know, an adenine without the sugar. And so it's just like it, so just missing that, that nucleotide part. Okay. <clears throat> That's why, and I'll try to remember to put this on, and, and I don't put this on my fire. Send me an email with the next day or two. Send me an email because I'm really behind in updating my fire since the entire outage. It's been a pain trying to get caught up. <clears throat> so complex two is succinate dehydrogenase from the citric acid cycle. And the way that it looks is it's really huge. Succinate dehydrogenase is huge. And remember from the citric acid cycle, I said one of them. They all occur in the mitochondrial matrix, except for one of them has a part of it that touches and is actually inserted into the mitochondrial. Intermembrane, in, inner membrane, I'm sorry, inner membrane, and this is succinate dehydrogenase. And so that's where, remember, succinate dehyd dehydrogenase made the FADH2, it then gives off the FADH2 to coenzyme Q. And it's fine with me, by the way, if you wanted to abbreviate um, ubiquinone as CoQ, that, that's fine. I mean, because that's, that's common, a common abbreviation, just like acetyl CoA, if you ever call it AC. You know, COA. <clears throat> Complex three is a little different. So I'm going to draw. I wouldn't put this, if you want to make a little tiny figure, you can, but I wouldn't put this as your big figure where we're going to actually start labeling things in it. But this is kind of the way it looks. This would be like complex two. This may not be drawn to scale. Okay, I'm just going to put two down here. Um, then, and once again, there are lipids, you know, because this is the membrane. Then we've got complex Okay, so then we've got complex three. Let me get a different color. By the way, complex three is the one that I worked on. It completely transverses the membrane. So this is complex three. And it's called cytochrome BC1 reductase. And see, this is where it gets a little confusing for some people because it does matter that C1 is different than cytochrome C. And I call it, I don't know why, and like I, said, I don't know why they got the letters that they got historically. <clears throat> Once again, we still have Lipids going through. Whoops, that lipid's backwards. You die. Okay. And then we'd have complex four. Which complex four is called cytochrome C oxidase. And the reason why is it because it oxidizes cytochrome C. Cytochrome BC1 reductase, what it does is it takes the coenzyme Q and it gets the electrons from it and passes it off to cytochrome C. Notice cytochrome C is not on here. Cytochrome C is not considered a complex, so I'll give it a different color. And its location is very important. We're gonna find out a lot about, cytochrome C is a major player in your body. Cytochrome C, this 
jumps, for lack of a better word, from complex three to complex four, and it's located in the intermembrane space. It's very important. Does anyone know why is it important that your cytochrome C is located in the intermembrane space? What happens if, it does, if it, it's not there? Cytochrome C has two major roles in your body. One is the electron transport chain. What's the other one? It's actually another role that your mitochondria plays. So, I mean, mitochondria is an energy house, but it also has a major role for another major cellular function. This is where I really wish I had like Disney's Circle of Life to play right now. <laughs> it's cell death. Okay, so what happens is, that, and we'll talk about it in greater detail later on, that as your mitochondria give out, there's to all things there's a season, there's time for everything, and as it starts to become, technical terms, fenestrated, holy, it starts to break things down, that cytochrome seed leaks out of the intermembrane space. And whenever that does happen, is it actually is one of the cascades to initiate cell death. So that means the mitochondria is acting up, bad things are happening, and so it's time to go on. <laughs> so um, that's why it's really important here for this reason, for electron transport chain, that the cytochrome C is in that intermembrane space. Remember, there's still another membrane out here called the outer membrane, and that would be the cytosol. Like on your big, big picture, you may want to put that on, but this is just a little one to show you what happens. The other player that's not on here is coenzyme Q. Uh, coenzyme Q, let's see. Oh, there we go. Coenzyme Q is in a couple places. So what it does is it either starts off at complex one or complex two and travels to complex three. And actually it's much more complicated than this. It's called the Q cycle and we'll go into that in great detail. That's why on your big figure when we get to that part, that's really nice to have a really big figure. And actually, I never thought of that before and had students have like a big sheet of paper that they just use throughout this chapter um, as we go through all of this. But this is what the electron transport chain looks like. And in the meantime, what's happening is protons get shuttled through here and here and here. But they don't get settled through on, on um, complex two. So that's the reason why, since you start off with FADH at this point, oops, you know, the FADH starts off down here. Um, you miss that first whole set of protons, and that's why it doesn't make as many, in the, and ultimately make, make as many ATPs, I should say. Whereas the NADH starts off over here. Whoops, NADH, not NADH2. But we're going to break it down through each one of these. Oh, it went to sleep on me. Just like some students. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit into about coenzyme Q. So technically it's called ubiquinone or ubiquinol, depending upon its state of oxidation. And another way to look at it is whenever it's ubiquinol, the way that I remember it, ubiquinol, alcohols, see it has the alcohols, the alcohols have hydrogens. So that's why another way to abbreviate that is QH2 to indicate that it's ubiquinol. Ubiquinone are ketones. So, and since they don't have an alcohol, they don't have an H's. So they're, they just abbreviated as Q to QH2. Now, one thing that's different about quinones than some of the other acceptors, and we talked about this a little bit, was it last chapter we talked a little bit about the, the quinols? Yeah, like the quininoid intermediates. Um, is it can it actually accept one proton at a time or one electron at a time. So notice right here, it takes a proton and an electron and it makes what's called a semiquinone. 
which is a radical, but it doesn't leave the, it shouldn't, at least if you're healthy, it does not leave the membrane. Because these are highly hydrophobic. See, it's got this really huge, it's called an isoprenoid, isoprenoid tail. This one that they're showing here is at least 10 carbons. It's so hydrophobic, is it, gets, it stays in that membrane, the inter, on the inner membrane. So you don't have to worry about it jumping all over the place. Okay. And then they just called it R down here. So it can accept one proton and one electron to make semiquinone. Then it can accept the second proton and electron to make ubiquinol. So knowing what you know from organic chemistry, and you just look at the carbon, carbons and oxygens here, is this the fully oxidized or the fully reduced form? It's oxidized. I probably should use a different color. And so when it's QH2, is it reduced or oxidized? It's reduced. And remember, Leo the lion goes grr. And it's really important electron transport chain. So when it gains electrons, it means it's reduced. When it loses electrons, it's oxidized. So that's why it's this form right here that can pass off the electrons to complex three. It's this form that gets the electrons from complexes one or two. <clears throat> yeah, that's why. Pardon? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, so if we go back, maybe I'll just show a little picture. So what I mean by that is, remember this is in the membrane. I don't want to have to try to redraw the membrane. That was complex one. So what complex one does, like I said, this is all in the membrane is it passes off the electrons to make from Q to QH2. Okay. And it gets those electrons from NADH. Technically it's NADH plus a proton. I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm wrong. Technically it's just NAD... No, I was right. NAD plus. Okay. So where, what happens is the reduced NADH becomes NAD, and the electrons get shuttled, and we'll talk about that in greater detail later, get shuttled to go from Q to QH2. Then it's this QH2 that travels all the way to complex three. And it's much more complicated than what I would draw here. But ultimately, you're going to get the Q back to go back either to complex one or complex two. I'm not showing it, but complex two is similar to complex one right there, except it starts with FADH. And it doesn't go all the way through the membrane. <clears throat> one last thing that's common to many of these complexes are what's called iron sulfur centers. Okay. And we see this a lot with electron transport because iron, I'm not an inorganic chemist to talk about like what it is that makes iron so special and its ability to accept and give off electrons. You know, it changes the oxidation number. Um, and it depends upon the geometry. But they just, they abbreviate it as FES. Sometimes I'll even say like FES2, Fe2S2, which means a two to two, or maybe it's like Fe2S6 or something like that, but a lot of times they just call them F, Fe centers. And if you notice, what happens is the iron gets chelated or holds, is held onto by sulfurs. The sulfurs, of course, we only have one amino acid that naturally occurs in proteins that has a free thiol, and that's cysteine. So cysteines typically hold them in place. And once again, and I don't know the physics behind it personally, but depending upon the shape, it changes its electron potential. Okay, and so you can have lots of different shapes. Like this is just a simple square planar. You can have one that's, uh, I don't know what that shape is technically, but it's where there's two. You can have something that's more of a cubic form in that sense, okay? And so that's why whenever, in some of these complexes, whenever you write FES, it's talking about something like this. And what happens is this iron can accept an electron and then it can pass it off. Okay. And likewise, there's something, there are coppers that we'll find out in complex 
four that are important that does something similar, but they can accept the electrons and the coppers can pass it off. This, well, this one, we're going to find it in multiple places. This is, this is in complex one, which is the first one that we're going to see. It's going to be in complex one. But we'll, you'll see these in other things, too. A lot of times, proteins and enzymes that have to deal with free radicals or moving electrons in general will have iron sulfur centers or something similar to that. Okay.